We have 33 people signed on. I know we had a little bit of a, a snafu with the meeting invite. Um, so I'm going to just kind of hang here for a few more minutes while we wait for everybody to get back on. Kim sent out the link again, just in case anyone was confused. So I'll just give it a couple more minutes. All right, so we're at 46 people in climbing and uh, the people they have to report after me are on. So we're gonna get the show on the road. It's a beautiful sunny day and it's finally warmer than it was this morning. Um, this morning was ridiculous. I'm not used to it, the weather yet. <laughs> so uh, welcome everybody to the October College Senate meeting. And uh, again, forgive us for the uh, snafu with the link and all of that, but uh, Kim and I talked earlier today, and we are going to put a new system in place starting for the November meeting. Uh, so hopefully that won't happen again. So again, thank you for your patience and uh, and for letting us know that there was an issue. Um, so over uh, the, the last month or so, we've had a couple additions to our Bennett. Uh, we have a uh, new voting liaison, Joe Lundeen from ITS, is joining us as a senator. And we have some student representatives that are also going to be, uh, some of them are actually on the call right now. So um, is Jason Perry on? Yes. Do you want to introduce your students real quick? Sure. Um, we have uh, three new student government um, executive uh, representatives, two presidents currently, and um, one uh, other person at city campus who is sitting in, in lieu of the president who hasn't been um, appointed yet. But at South Campus, we have uh, Andrew Gonzalez Kennedy. At North Campus, we have uh, Brianer Carbarano Simanca and uh, Sime Huang at city campus. So um, we welcome you and we're excited to have your student energy as part of the College Senate. Absolutely. Thank you, Jason. Welcome to the students. And so, you know, as um, student representatives to the Senate, you are allowed to ask questions and on any topic that we're talking about and or make comments uh, either on either way, whether you agree or disagree. And then everything that we vote on, you uh, are allowed to vote. So don't um, sit those out. You're allowed to vote. Okay. Um, all right. So looking through my list of things. All right. So we uh, are going to be starting a chancellor's award committee. I feel like we talk about it every year. Um, but Erica Hendra so nicely allowed me to appoint her as the chair. 
And so what we're thinking moving forward is that we will uh, are going to change the bylaws or at least attempt to change the bylaws to give a larger description to this college Senate vice president and what our vision is, is that moving forward, whoever is the college Senate vice president uh, or vice chair, sorry, is going to be the chair of the chancellor's committee. So that way we keep it within shared governance and uh, which is where it's supposed to be anyway. So uh, we will be reaching out to people that have uh, contacted us about being a part of that committee, uh, probably by the end of the week. Um, so a couple of things that we've been working on, but aren't on the agenda, because it's just things we've been working on. Uh, Guided Pathways Institute 2 is next week, and uh, we've been working on the pre-work for this next uh, uh, sorry, the chat box is going off. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's next week. We've been doing a lot of pre-work. We've met a few times uh, and just it's been a lot of uh, hard work. So I want to just thank the team for that. And we'll be able to give everyone a, a larger update at the November meeting about what's going on with Guided Pathways. Um, and then I'm also wondering if you have a camera available, would you mind... Uh, turning it on just so that way it feels like I'm not talking into space. I see a couple of you and I appreciate it. Thank you. But uh, if you got a camera, go ahead and turn it on, please. Thanks. And um, we're working on a student expectations, uh, which is an adaptation of the online Bill of Rights. That group has met a couple of times. And we'll be meeting again on Friday to get some final language together. And from that, we're going to send it over to FFECC uh, executive committee to get their take on it. And if they're good with it, then we will be uh, voting on that in November to forward that on to become future board policy. So that's where we are with those things. And then um, I just want to take a plug for our enrollment uh, team. We are all responsible for the retention of our students. We need to make sure we are reaching out to our students, talk to our students at classes. Hey, you know, what are your plans for next semester? Advisement is going to be key for these students. And even though, you know, you can't register for classes until November, that doesn't mean it's not too early to start talking about those things with your students now. We want to try to get, my goal is, I want all of the students in my classes and the 25 advisees that I have, registered by the end of the semester, unless they are, of course, um, graduating in December. So uh, that is something that's very important for all of us. And so speaking of that, um, there is an open house coming up, and I believe things are going on the website soon. It's next, no, it's in two weeks, but it's going to be virtual, and there's going to be faculty rooms where students can pop out into the different rooms and the different majors to talk to the faculty there. Um, and it's going to be October 27th at North Campus, October 28th at South Campus, and October 29th at City Campus. Um, and I think uh, that's all I got for our opening today. And I would like to pass it on to Interim President Bill Ruder. Thanks, Colleen. Uh, just some quick updates. And please, if you have questions or need elaboration, please uh, don't, don't stop, ask questions. Uh, just some random thoughts. State budget, we are still feeling the effects of some unknowns with the state. The, the language that's coming out of the state is delays not cuts. They are very intentional with their messaging. And that means that we received a delay in our fourth quarter payment of 20%. We have budgeted a 20% reduction for next year in state aid. And just over the past few weeks, uh, TAP is in question. As oh, my well God. Celsius scholarship. So those are all anticipated delays. We were delayed in when we received our fourth quarter payment in 1920, and we are being delayed in when we receive our 2021 payment. Our, we normally get quarterly payments from the state of New York based upon our enrollment. 
on enrollment. Uh, again, these are called delays because it's unknown whether there's going to be stimulus. If there's no stimulus, if I was a betting person, which I am not, I don't like losing money. If I was a betting person, I suspect delays would turn into cuts. We, again, have budgeted for it. We have projected year in 1920 for the cut. So anything we get above the 20% reduction would be good. But we are anticipating a 20% cut. As far as enrollment, as of this morning, we are down 18.2% fall to fall. It, same for headcount and same for FTs. If there is any kind of good news, uh, which there really isn't, our first-time students are down on an FT basis 9.9% year to year, and our continuing students 10.7%. So that really speaks to what uh, Colleen said about focus on retention of our students. It's a lot easier to retain a student, have them persist from fall to spring, versus getting new students. We are dramatically down on our returning and our transfer students are, even though it's a small population, our transfer students are down 84%. Enrollment amongst all constituent groups at the college are down. By campus, South has taken the largest hit and we are down over 20, almost 25% South fall to fall. So we are at 1,546 students only Last year, same point in time, we were over 2,047 students. So all three campuses are down. Our high school numbers are down. Uh, distance learning is the only area that we're seeing any kind of growth as far as enrollment. And um, that is going to lead to some serious discussions in, within the college and external to the college about the future of the Erie Community College as we know it today. And you know, I'm gonna tell the truth, I will inform uh, this, the Senate, as well as anyone who wants to talk about it, uh, we, you know, the, the traditional model that we currently have at ECC is going to be a challenge if we continue to see the enrollment declines. Earlier today, I received a call from the executive director of the ASC that the uh, bookstore at South Campus is at risk of closing. Uh, I was informed that our child care at South Campus has no students. I was informed that we are generating a whopping $50 a day approximately in uh, funds from our cafeteria at South Campus. So I just, again, I am not going to sugarcoat things. We, ECC, who we've been, uh, is, is seriously in challenge. I and the college have embarked on some personnel reductions to try to offset some of the financial shortfalls. Uh, we had a very successful early retirement incentive in 1920. We actually had 30 individuals that participated in that retirement incentive. I believe 24 faculty, five administrators, and one member of the senior executive staff. Over the past couple of weeks, we've had to engage in some uh, continued personnel reductions. We had uh, three individuals that positions were eliminated, and then I believe we had another 24, 25 that did not have their one year of service in within one of the unions and they were let go before that probationary period ended. And then we also extended the early retirement incentive to not just the faculty and the administrators for 2021. And we extended that to uh, both the clerical CSEA, the white collar union and AFSCME, the blue collar union that's uh, at the college. And as of Monday, I believe we had 28 individuals that indicated that they are interested in potentially participating in that retirement incentive. All told, if uh, those 28 combined with the layoffs and last year's early retirement incentive, we're looking at about a savings of just a shade under $10 million. This college has done a pet poor job over the past several years. We have added a number of staff and at a time when our enrollment has had significant declines, and we have to reverse that trend. We spend 80% of our budget on salary and benefits. And the only way to make an impact is to lessen the footprint of the, the staff at this institution. I will not impact the safety and security of our students. And I will not impact the academic mission of this institution. But there are some painful changes. 
I know people probably don't support every move, but these are difficult decisions that have to be made to sustain operations at this college. This college, our credit enrollment since 2010-11 is down 46.7%. Again, 46.7%. You are seeing businesses close because they're not generating the sales through COVID-19. We were in a free fall for enrollment before COVID-19, and that has just accelerated things. We have many in entities that are looking at this college. I had to make a presentation to the control board last Thursday. They wanted us to resubmit another budget. They, they deemed our budget not to be in balance. You have the county legislature looking at it. You have the county executive, and you certainly have the board of trustees. Board of trustees has a retreat next Friday. Sort of the future of ECC will be an agenda item that's discussed. No decisions obviously can or will be made so quickly, but we will be gathering information for this, uh, for the, all those constituent groups to engage in discussions moving forward. I, you know, I, I thank you for your support. We are trying from a senior staff level to engage in better communication. I appreciate members of the college reaching out to me and sharing some concerns and hopefully we're being more inclusive. It's critical, as Colleen said, for the enrollment cycle for everybody to be involved. It's not senior staff that are responsible. It's not the counselors, not the academic advisors, not the academic, uh, the athletics or the recruiters. It is everybody at this institution that needs to be involved. So I appreciate that. No idea is a bad idea, uh, but you know, it, sometimes it takes a little while to um, evaluate the, the pros and cons. But please, if you have thoughts, ideas, share them. And uh, we're in this together. It's not me as interim president. It's not, you know, the senior staff. It, it's everybody at this college. And I wish it, it was better news. Uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. My job is to get this college back in a better place for the permanent president where he or she is hired and we still have some work to do. With that, I will close my comments and I don't know, Colleen, if you wanna open the floor for any kind of questions, I'd be more than happy to address them. Great, um, I have Phil Struble available too if anybody has questions for either um, Phil about his update, or if you have any questions for Phil regarding open house and enrollment. You can unmute yourself if you have a question. I expect the answer is you don't know, but once we start getting students for advisement for the spring, do we have any idea if we are not going to be remote or when that decision will be made because that's the question every parent and every student in Erie County is asking. Patty, I meant, to even, uh, I meant to address that. Thank you for bringing it up. I have directed uh, the staff that we will be similar to fall as far as the remote instruction, those labs, technologies, and health sciences will be in person with reduced footprints. Uh, SUNY has now scheduled a conference call for Thursday afternoon, I believe, at 5 o'clock. With the chancellor, they may tell me something differently, but for now, it's you're exactly right. I think we maybe missed the boat a little on our communication and uh, getting the word out how we were going to deliver courses in the fall. There's still a lot of unknowns, uh, certainly with the K through 12 system. There's they're changing dynamics almost on a daily basis. But we, the word that we're moving forward with is we will have the same uh, instruction mode that we have for the fall. And we will make our students and staff and faculty feel safe and secure. Thanks to Amy, thanks for Mark. Uh, we are doing the pool testing. I think as of yesterday, don't quote me on these numbers because I don't like to be wrong, but I think we had 670 students, mainly students that limited two staff members maybe a day. Uh, 670 people were tested, and we had no positive results through the pool testing, but individuals are getting tested outside the college, and we've had some positive tests, and through the efforts of Mark and Amy, they've done a great job on isolating those students, notifying the students that may be impacted, 
and engaging the county to initiate contact tracing immediately. Great, thank you, Bill. Uh, does anyone have any other questions for either Bill or Phil? Okay, and I just wanna reiterate that uh, what Bill said that enrollment and retention is everybody's job. We, our jobs are at stake, right? It's everybody's job. We need to retain students and advisement is key. And this is what has to be happening, period, end of story. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to the COVID-19 uh, team, Amy Yoder and Mark Pacholik. Hi, Colleen. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me again. <laughs> Always a pleasure to see everyone. This is probably the biggest amount of faces that I ever see on my computer screen. So I always appreciate seeing all the smiles. Um, so we're doing really well. I, I really wanna commend everybody for their efforts. Um, we are not in the news about COVID. Um, we are not hearing that we have outbreaks or clusters. And as Bill mentioned, um, 680 of our students, small amount of our staff have been tested thus far. And we've had no positives from those pool tested. So I think that's really important. I'm not saying that there hasn't been some positives that haven't affected our campus, um, but we've handled them in such a great way. Um, so I thank you all so much. I know this has been a confusing time. There has been um, you know, questions on checkpoints and the campus clear up and everything else, but everyone has been so amazing and so helpful in following through with us. So I thank you all so much for your support. I do have a favor to ask though, that's why I'm here today. <laughs> so I had to bribe Colleen for three minutes of her time today. So one of the things that I am, I'm seeing with some of the students that I've encountered that have, have tested positive is that they've had a concern about missing class. So if I can implore on you, the faculty here to just remind students that you do have a plan B in mind should they not have not be able to attend class and we want to emphasize to students if you're sick don't feel good have symptoms do not come to campus that is so so important um, i think they need to hear that from you um, especially those face-to-face -face classes they're super concerned about missing material or missing time with you um, so please if you could just please remind your students that it's okay to miss class especially if you're not feeling well and that there is a plan B for for making up the material um, we want the students to feel comfortable staying home and not coming in um, I had an individual a few weeks ago who had lost their 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 sense of taste and knew something was weird going on with them but they still came to campus because they were concerned about a test I would rather them stop and say you know what I know I can contact the professor, let them know I have something going on, and they'll make accommodations for my test. So if you could do that big favor for me, that would be huge, and it'll keep us going in the right direction. So by all means, and I, I say this every time, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. I give everyone my cell phone number, 525-4500, real easy to remember. Please ask, um, you know, no questions too small, no questions too big. We'd rather have that open communication and stop rumors or correct anything or just give you the right piece of advice. Um, we have rapid testing going on every day through the county as well. So you as staff are eligible for to participate in our pool testing, but should you also need a test through rapid testing for whatever reason, just reach out to Mark or I. Um, so I'll give Mark a chance to talk if he wants to say hi, because he always does. <laughs> But I always say this to everyone, keep in mind, keep your distance, wash your hands, wear your mask, and go Bills. I'll pass it over to you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Amy, good afternoon, everybody. Amy hit most of it on the head. Uh, the pool testing is available, and we've had good success getting instructors uh, tested quickly so they can get back into the game. Uh, they will probably be... Uh, upping their hours with the rapid testing in the county. Uh, there's about 400,000 more rapid tests being made available to education lines. So our ability to test at a greater number is getting improved. That's all I have, Amy. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Like I said, we're always open to any questions that might come up. Thanks so much for the time, Colleen. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. And then just real quick, because I'm on those COVID calls, do you want to just mention to people what um, they should do if they make an error on Campus Clear? Absolutely. So if you make an error on Campus Clear, which it can happen, it's okay. Um, one of our contact tracers, chances are, will contact you just to kind of assess your situation. But if you want immediate help, please contact um, the, you can either call dispatch and just let them know, hey, I fat fingered, so sorry, whatever. And they'll give you the color of the day, which I make up the colors of the week. And they're always very creative. And security gets a little upset with me because they're beautiful colors like wisteria and pink flamingo and eggplant and all kinds of fun stuff like that. So they'll let you know what the color of the day is so that you can still get access to campus. But just know if you do fail the screening app or, you know, even if you're unsure of some of the symptoms you have going on and you fill out the Campus Clear app, one of our contact tracers will reach out to you that day, talk with you and give you some kind of unneeded advice. You know, maybe it will be contact your healthcare provider or, yeah, you might want to stay away from campus. Hey, do you need to get a test? Let's get you in. Amy, one other thing I wanted to mention, or maybe you could mention if someone is interested in uh, volunteering for the pool testing, because it is open for staff. And I, I did volunteer. It was pretty painless and very quick. So it's not, you know, something if we are looking for staff members to volunteer as well. Yes, absolutely. We highly encourage you to participate. And the college is picking up the cost of it. So it doesn't cost you anything, by the way. Um, all you have to do is call 270-4679, Monday through Friday. And I can give Colleen this information or Kim so that she can you can send it out um, Monday through Friday and you can just schedule a test. We are on South Campus once a week, City Campus once a week, and North Campus twice a week. And we also are moving, let me also mention this too, we're also moving our hours on Tuesdays, I believe, moving more into the evening so that we can accommodate our evening students. Awesome. Thank you. I'll make sure I include this information when I send out the um, update email on uh, Thursday. Um, all right. I'm going to share my agenda here again. Maybe. All right. There we go. Uh, so under old business, we just have a couple of uh, governance uh, things t going on. Uh, so I'm going to call on uh Michael Rio. So we do have a uh, Joel and Dean is our new liaison. And so now that we have uh, full Senate um, uh, representation or as full as we can right now, um, we need to elect a person to the uh, College Senate Executive Committee. Uh, so Michael Rio, I'm going to pass it to you. Okay, thank you, Colleen. Sure. There is a um, bylaws change that was introduced at the last Senate meeting that needs to be voted on first. Okay. Uh, that allows us to conduct the election. In the current bylaws, there is no language uh, defining uh, process for those elections, and we are asking for a special election in this case, so there's language addressing special elections. Uh, Great. If, I'm going to get need... that up. Uh, do you want me to, can you share it, or do you want me to share it? If you have it, that would be great. I have to look for it. Um, yeah, I can show it. Hang on a second. Not share the papers I was just creating. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I, I can read it to you until until it comes up. And what we really need is a, is a motion to um, discuss and vote. So what we're adding to the um, bylaws under Article 9, the election process is a process that states that the uh, executive committee, all right, elected senators, will that election will take place in a similar fashion as the election process for chair and vice chair, which is a secret ballot from the floor of the Senate. Election happens in May, term start in June. Right now we're engaging in a special election because there was uh, a seat that was resigned and to fill that vacancy, we have to follow um, guidelines for a special term or a special election, and that language is included as well. So whoever is elected to fill the vacant seat at this time would begin a term and uh, fill until June 1st, and then a, 
a three-year term would begin on June 1st, 2021. Uh, with a motion to proceed to a vote, we can have further discussion. Okay. Which I don't know if it's necessary for a bylaws change, but it'd be good to hear well, from people out there. Right. Well, so uh, who would like to make a motion? I'll okay. make a motion. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, and who would like to second it? I'll second it. Thank you, Cooper. All right, so discussion on uh, on the matter. Uh, okay, no. <laughs> it's not really exciting stuff here. I mean, procedurally, if there's no discussion, um, we can call the question. All right. Uh, so, well, if there's no discussion on the matter, then uh, that means that we are silent in agreement. So I'm going to say that this passes. Okay. And there we go. Hmm. So now that we have um, passed this bylaw, it's time to move into election to the College Senate Executive Committee. Okay. Uh, so, Michael, can you share any nominations? Yeah, so one nomination was, was put forward. Uh, we received a nomination for uh, Catherine Clesto, and uh, we can open for further nominations from the floor of the Senate at this time, and then nominees can address the Senate and we can conduct the election. Okay. Not, nominations must include uh, members currently sitting on the Senate or serving on the Senate. So kind of flip through the faces and names that you see on your screen and you can make nominations or um, just say hi to people on a side chat. Can we make those, you said we can make those nominations in the chat box or? Uh, you, you, can, a, you can make them now, yeah. Open right now or the chat box, whatever works. Okay. Now, can I nominate Joe Lundin, please? Right. Yes. Nice. We can close this if there aren't any further nominations. Um, um, Michael, I'm interested. I nominate myself. Is that Petrina? Yes, yep. it is. Okay. Any other nominations from the floor of the Senate? It looks like there's one in the chat box from Tracy. Oh, I should open that up. Yeah. Uh, Tahira. Okay. Okay, I think. Uh, yep, I'm getting it. Um, I'm getting it together right now, and I'm entering the names in the order that they were uh, said here. Um, but before um, Joe Lundin and uh, Tahira, you've been nominated. Are you interested in participating in the election? Um, I am not. I, I just have been uh, elected to to a voting liaison, so I, I appreciate it, and thank you, John. Um, I definitely appreciate it. I, I think I want to get um, some voting under under my feet first before I accept. Fair enough. 
Hi, this is Tahira. I, um, like Jolandine, I am going to decline. Thank you, Tracy Archie, for thinking of me. Um, but I still have a lot of work to do uh, in terms of Senate and um, some other committees that I'm just beginning to lead. And um, I just don't have uh, the time right now to, to put what I would need to put into um, this effort. Okay, thank you very much, uh, both of you. It, it is um, completely understandable. It's, you know, it's, it's definitely, if you're in the middle of a bunch of things, it's, it can be difficult. Okay, so before we um, vote, um, I would like to allow both candidates to give us a little um, synopsis on why they think they should they are the best candidate for the office. Uh, and we'll just go in order if uh, from nominations. So I'll call on Kathy first. Thank you, Colleen. Um, so shared governance is an important factor contributing to the stewardship of the existing resources and services that we provide our students. The concept of continually sharing resources, discussing multiple perspectives, and using the diverse range of expertise available at the college in the decision-making process allows the institution to be mission-oriented and focused on putting students first, especially through the pivotal and difficult changes taking place today. I would be honored to take a more active role in supporting the mission of the college and impacting the broader student body by serving on the senior executive or the Senate Executive Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Petrina? Yes, thank you for the opportunity. I also, too, would like the opportunity to participate in share governance. As an administrator, seasoned administrator at the college, I often feel that uh, the student affairs and the administration of the college do not feel that we have a voice in helping students to be successful at the college. And I would like the opportunity to bring these perspectives into the executive committee and also the shared governance structure. I too would also be honored to serve in that fashion. All right, excellent. So um, with that, I'm going to open the poll, hopefully, and again, only vote if you are an actual voting member and students remember you are a voting member as well um and only voting liaisons are allowed to vote um because i know there's some other liaisons that are here obviously for reporting and stuff uh so with that i'm going to open the poll
Colleen, do you mind if I make a parliamentary comment? Yes, thank you. Michael um, please, uh, Yes, please only vote for one. Oh. Voting for two will should disqualify your vote, although I don't know if we can track that. It, it does track that. Thank you. Thank goodness. Thank you. I'm just scanning the list of people that have not started yet just to make sure they're not voting members. I'm also scanning who's finished voting uh, so I can also make sure that it's uh, legit. All right, I was on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm wondering if I can share my screen so I can, so you guys don't have to, let's see. All right, it's not gonna let me do that. So give me a second. I'm gonna unshare for a second. Charlene, once you close out the poll, it will give you a report that you can then share out. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Bob. I'm going to share just the poll results because it uh, should be. It's a. All right, so I hit share with attendees poll results. Were you able to see anything? Everybody saw it? Okay, because it doesn't show me that um, you saw it. That's why I've been kind of, thank you, Marianne. Uh, all right, so the results are in. I scanned all 55 uh, votes. The 13 people that did not vote were not supposed to vote. And all the people that did vote are voting members of the College Senate. So in a very tight race there, uh, Kathy Calesto is, uh, won the election and will be joining the College Senate uh, executive team. Congratulations, Kathy. Uh, all right. Oh, Colleen? Yes. Can you save that list um, and send a copy to governance as well? We're charged with just reviewing the election results. Oh, for sure. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. And congratulations, Absolutely. Kathy. Yeah, and I can send the individual um, polling results to governance as well. All right, so we're going to move into new business. And I have uh, Erickson Neelands up for that. Erickson, uh, we tested earlier. You can share your screen if you want, or I can share the documents for you up to you if you can show the documents for you that'd be great i'll be honest i didn't have those ready i wasn't expecting that so um that would be <laughs> fantastic okay. if you wanted to yeah no i'll get them up no problem okay appreciate it and i can explain uh what it is that uh Colleen is putting up here um there's two important items uh that i wanted to share with each of you today uh first is we have three of the suny erie ilo's our internal uh, learning outcomes for the general education um, requirements this is kind of the middle states ones that we've identified 
And there are three documents that we would absolutely love to get your input on. These are for quantitative reasoning, uh, scientific reasoning, as well as technological competence. Um, last academic year, the natural sciences and math departments contributed heavily to these, and I want to thank each of them, uh, especially with going through all those transitions in the spring uh, to still be able to continue to contribute to the assessment effort, and then myself and Bill and then the General Education Committee uh, took these results and did our uh. first attempt, um, and that's what you see in the report. And we, at the last meeting, uh, just last week, um, went through these, and we did vote on these documents that are shared through the College Senate website. Um, and I'll try to pull those up maybe at this time as well, just to uh, bring that here. The second item um, for there, oh, let me just actually just kind of go through then the, uh, the timeline. Um, in terms of our hopes, is that you have an opportunity to take a look at these. You can send comments, uh, feedback to me directly. That's at neelandse at ecc.edu. Um, you can, again, access these documents through uh, the College October, uh, the College Senate October meeting uh, documents. They're the first three that are at the top. Uh, I do actually have those now, so I can share those with you. So hopefully everyone should be able to see my screen. Uh, what I have here is the first one with regards to quantitative reasoning. Then I also have for scientific reasoning. <clears throat> and then lastly is for the technological competence. So again, any feedback that you have, that would be great and greatly appreciated. Um, our intention is to give a little bit extra time if needed to try to accommodate to your busy schedules right now. So if we have an opportunity to review these and vote at these in November, fantastic. But if not, we can certainly do that then for the December meeting. Uh, and then the second item I wanted to bring to everyone's attention is at the General Education Committee, uh, Bill Falls actually had this remarkable idea through the physics department and my co-chair, uh, which is the idea of amending our current SUNY Erie ILO assessment schedule. And what we have decided to do, and we agreed to this uh, unanimously, is to amend our current schedule uh, when the assessment of those uh, in lieu of the current circumstances that we face related to COVID-19. And we would rather decide to spend our efforts actually looking at all of the ILOs in a voluntary basis. So I want to emphasize that it's a voluntary basis of looking at uh, a representative but smaller likely sample size of different sections to look at then the impact that COVID and our remote learning, the variety of uh, confounding factors that we have right now that may be uh, playing a role in terms of student performance on a general education outcomes. Um, and we want to then take a look at those. And in the very likely event that if our performances are, let's say, comparable to what they were in our previous assessments that we've done the last two academic years, we would really like to highlight those and, and really highlight, I think, the accomplishments of both the faculty and students uh, who are working, I think, so diligently at this time. So I, I open up for any questions or comments that you have. Um, otherwise, I appreciate you taking the time to hear that. And, and I really do look forward to the comments you have on the ILO reports as well. And I will stop sharing, Colleen, so you should have that back. Thank you. Um, and as everyone uh, knows, uh, the ILOs and working with um, general education and all the other curriculum committees at the college are uh, really the bread and butter of some of the things that we do here in shared governance. Um, so please, if you have comments or questions, um, you know, please review these documents and get back to us because this is important for us as an institution, but also for middle states and accreditation. So it's uh, important work for, for all of us. Thank you, Erickson. I'm gonna try to share my screen again. <laughs> Sorry about the black screen there. And my, there we go. All right, so uh, we have up next uh, micro-credential policy. This is also going to be a voting uh, item. And I'd like to welcome Brian Milville from uh, College-Wide Curriculum Committee. 
um, to talk about this. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can take it over, Brian. Yep. Thank you, Colleen. Hello, everybody. All right. I have... I had the documents uh, available in off the Senate site as well, but I've got this as a PDF and there's some links in the PDF to some of the documents from the, the, um, from the Senate site in here. So I'm gonna first just start by taking us to the SUNY site on micro-credentials, just to find out for those of you that aren't familiar with that, a little bit about what those are. Okay, and I'm just gonna give everybody a minute and if you just Googled SUNY micro-credentials, you would get here quite quickly. I'm just going to give everybody a moment to read through that first paragraph about what are micro-credentials. Okay, so... Uh, these are you know, going to be something smaller than a certificate. Typically, you know, what we deal with at the curriculum committee are maybe new certificate proposals or associate's degree proposals or modifications of such. But these will be smaller, right? smaller than a certificate. And we're going to look at a couple more things off of the SUNY site and get back to uh, my short uh, PowerPoint over there. And then please just interrupt me if you have any questions during this. But I'm going to go down a little bit further on this site. And I'm just going to welcome anybody, if, if you're really interested in it, to take a look at, on the right-hand side, there's a number of links, but the full micro-credentials task force from SUNY is at the very bottom. But it's a little bit more about what these are and uh, coming off the SUNY site before we get to what we've developed uh, at, through the curriculum committee. So a micro-credentials comp, something that's company-based, it's going to be endorsed by the institution developed through the local faculty governance processes through the curriculum committee, and then uh, obviously we report to the Senate. All right, meaningful, high quality with, you know, learning standards and assessments, clear documentation of the skills mastered. All right, and we'll talk about the different types of ways we're going to be documenting those below. All right, I want to get to these guiding principles and how they're kind of reflected in what we're going to do uh, at Erie Community College. And I have those over in my slideshow, so I'm gonna navigate back over there. And these are on the second and third slides. I have this over in the PDF form here. All right, so the first one, academic quality is paramount, all right, so, and faculty governance participation is required. And that's a repeated theme if you read the whole task force report. All right, so for us, we were taking this from the curriculum committees to the college senate, eventually hopefully approved by the board of trustees. All right, second thing, and I think this one's an important one, that, that they're initially locally developed and approved locally. So they can be a little bit quicker developed than, say, a certificate or an associate's degree because we can avoid the SUNY and SED pipeline. That can take many, many months to get approval of a new program or modifications to an existing program, whether that's an associate's or certificate program. All right, so that's something that, that's kind of nice. Even if somebody was thinking about developing a certificate, say maybe they could get a couple of micro-credentials just to get it started and then you know, at the same time build that certificate if that was the goal. And then the next two, number three and four, deal with uh, what I would call some opportunities for us here. So they're designed to meet market needs and these two things are pretty related to each, each other. And the fourth one, it can provide opportunities for uh, connections between certain industries. So we already have many connections in, in our various programs uh, to local industries. This could provide additional opportunities for those connections and maybe some new ones there as well. I'm just going to share a quick example that uh, Tony D'Alessio presented last fall at convocation. Uh, my Mohawk, Community Mohawk Valley Community Colleges, they, they developed a micro-credential called Kitchen Competencies and they did that for some local supermarkets and delis that you know, didn't need a whole certificate, but they needed a certain set of skills for certain, you know, for um, some job offerings that they had. So that's some again opportunities possibly for us. And then the last three are kind of all connected. They're you know they're more flexible, uh, they're portable, should be portable and stacked, stackable. These are all I would I would call student centered types of um, principles that are going to guide us, which is certainly our, our focus here at ECC. All right, moving forward here. Uh, just a couple quick words about how we came to the policy, and I've got the policy up here on the screen I can get to uh, as well. And we'll but 
we what we did through NCDC and CWCC is we adapted some language from um, New Paltz Tompkins Community College and uh, SUNY Albany a little bit. We discussed this at multiple meetings. We also took some ideas from uh, SUNY Buffalo um, in the aspect that we're going to offer two types. One is what we're going to call a curricular micro-credential, and that's going to be reserved for credit-bearing offerings. That could be a course or a couple of courses put together. Most of the ones, if you look off SUNY's site, most of the micro-credentials offered by community colleges, all of the 24 or 5, I think, but two are credit-bearing. So I think that's probably where we'll likely start. Um, but we're also well, we'll be offering what's called a competency badge, and there's a lot of different terminologies regarding micro-credentials. There's a digital badge, for, which could be for non-credit and for credit. All right, and then we also created this uh, proposal form, which you can take a look at for yourself there as well. Um, let's go over to the policy now. Look at that. Oops, that's the board format for it. So I'm not going to read through the whole policy because I'm assuming everybody that um, had access to this document before. But just to kind of look at the two groupings here, the curricular micro-credentials versus the competency badges, the curricular one was going to be all involving credit-bearing uh, courses already. And they might be also transcripted and possibly given a digital badge, okay? Whereas a competency badge, right, is this going to be something digital? Just going to be mainly a digital badge, not recorded on the transcript. Could be something non-credit as well, all right? Um, the college has some software, uh, Credly or Credly Acclaim, I can't remember, the name's changed a couple of times. Um, so those are the two types that we're looking to start with. And again, we've kind of taken these ideas you know, from other places and, and, and tossed these around in the curriculum committees. And this is what we've come up with uh, for our, our proposal here. Um, one other thing just to note that we're gonna have the same approval process as we would, would have uh, for a new certificate or a new degree that you're going to have to go through the curriculum committees for approval. Obviously, you're going to want approval from your unit, from your uh, academic dean, etc. cetera, are going through there. Um, the second page on here is some of the requirements for micro-credentials and competency badges, and I'm not going to uh, read through all of those ones. Some of them are uh, uh, parallel various college, various things we already have at the college, various policies we already have. One thing, just to point out for number five, and yeah, micro-credentials are smaller, but they're, they have to be less than 24 credits to be a micro-credential. And I don't know if I have too much more, Colleen, um, I'll take any questions. I just want to make sure on the last page, I just send a little shout out to our curriculum committee co-chairs, uh, myself and Jamie Smith and Kathy Kleston, Vanessa Haddad, and all of our, our team members that helped us to develop this. Uh, Ann Reed from SUNY Buffalo, uh, Carrie Kahn introduced us to her. We had a nice meeting with her. And then uh, last but not least, Tony D'Alessio has been uh, trumping this for a while for us to develop a policy, and we're finally hopefully close to it. So thank you, Tony. Um, Colleen, that's, I think, all I have. I don't know if you want me to leave it on the uh, micro-credential policy or if you want me to take any questions at the moment here. Um, well, why don't we do questions? Um, uh, well, actually, this is something that we're going to vote on. So, um, Brian, would you like to make a motion? Uh, can I make that motion? I don't know if I'm a voting member of the Senate. Um, all right. If I can, I will make the motion. Sure. All right. Yeah. So moved. Moved. So, moved. Patty, so moved. Thank you, Patty. All right. So now we can have some uh, discussion on that. I, I saw a, Tom uh, Webb had a hand up. Yeah, I have a question for Erickson. Um, for the micro uh, credentials, uh, John, you went on mute, I think, there. Mute. Yeah, we can hear you now. Whoop. No, yeah. I can't. Okay. Well, then I'll try it again. No, you're good. Don't hit it again. Okay. Uh, will any of those credit micro credential courses be fall into the ten SUNY Gen Ed categories? Um, that's I, they. I suppose that they could. I mean, if some you could develop a micro credential that's you know cons consisting of all if it made sense, right? Consisting of existing courses, and some of those could be SUNY Gen Ed. 
I don't see why they, they necessarily couldn't be. Um, there are probably some wrinkles that's going to have to, you know, be, be ironed out. You know, this is not going to be, this policy bubble doesn't maybe address every question that's going to come up, but we'll probably have to develop those. But I don't see why not, John. Okay, thank you. Other questions, concerns for Brian? Just one question, um, Brian, this is Fabio. Uh, just Fabio. wondering, um, the use of the word competency, um, I'm just wondering if that might lead to some confusion over program competencies, um, or is it intended that every competency badge would focus on a specific learning outcome in an academic program? I don't, I'm not reading it that way, so I'm wondering if maybe competency is just a little bit um, possibly confusing. I, I, I would say I'm not necessarily married to that terminology, Fabio, so um, I think we may be, uh, I, I honestly can't remember where we came up with competency badge, if it was adopted from somewhere else, but I mean, if we wanted to say digital badge, it would be okay with me. Yeah, uh, I just, I, I was just wondering about that, or skill. I. Skill badge. Skill badge. Yeah. Uh, but it is, I, I'm understanding that correctly, right? That it's intended to be, as it says here, um, those co curricular activities and or specific course related skills. Correct. Okay. Okay. Got it. So somebody, for example, who had picked up a specific skill in a course um, could be assigned the badge. And we would say at that point they they have a competency or a skill in that particular uh, thing, right? Yep. Okay. Correct. All right. Get it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. So, um, more questions, concerns. I feel like everybody's quiet when we're remote. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right, well, with that, I will um, put it to a vote. So I'm going to have to share. Okay, I'll start. Our, yep. Yeah, there we go. You take and over, yep. Let's see if I can manage this time. Try it. Colleen, can I ask a question? Sure can. Are we are we voting to make the modification that Fabio recommended or to approve this? Well, right now the motion on the floor is for as is written. Um, we can do a vote um, for um, the addition of Fabio's suggestions if we want, but we would need a motion to do that first. Okay. Fabio, would you like to make a motion to change the language or are we good? Uh, no, I'd rather get that from the floor if anybody else is interested in it. I just wanted to make the uh, suggestion. Okay. Anybody interested? I'm going to go with no. All right. I'm going to open the poll. <laughs> Who's laughing?
just waiting for about four more people to vote. Joel, yes, you're a voting member. All right, I am going to close the poll. And as you can see, the motion was approved uh, overwhelmingly. So uh, thank you very much, Brian, for uh, and your team for all your hard work for this, because this is something that can definitely be part of the future for SUNY Erie uh, so we can help more students in the community. Yep, thank you. Take care. All right, thanks. All right, uh, so next up we have, uh, there's been some uh, different things happening in our equity and diversity um, Committee and there's uh, some task force and things like that. So Tracy Archie and Tracy Cleveland are here to uh, let us know all of the great things that they are doing. Um, do you need me to share your documents or can, can you share them? No, I can share them, Colleen, thank you. Beautiful, thanks. All right, thanks the floor is yours, Tracy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Um, yes, there's a lot of great things going on here at the college. What I thought I would do is start off by sharing with you a little bit about uh, our Equity and Diversity Council. You all are familiar with, with us. We are uh, a body of members that really, uh, really ultimately reports to the president of the college. Um, we are comprised of 17 members. Uh, currently, right now, our makeup is uh, two SES staff, two academic deans, two deans of students, three faculty, six staff members, one student, and one committee member. And then we have our ex officio members, which are um, uh, President Bill Ruder and uh, Fabio Escobar in uh, IRAP office. So that is the makeup of who we are. Uh, we are a large body. Um, but we have three committees under our umbrella, which Tracy and I are going to tell you a little bit about. But uh, just generally, uh, just so you understand that diversity councils are a critical driver in fostering real organizational change at institutions, um, establishing a dedicated focus on diversity and inclusion priorities, and managing equity, diversity, and inclusion programs at the college's strategic uh, level and really in alignment with the college's strategic plan. So we are always looking back um, when we meet at what is it that the college's strategic plan wants to focus on to move us forward and how can we infuse uh, the different parts of EDI into that. Ultimately, the council uh, will not only develop strategy, but will also work toward action and change. And moreover, as a collective, uh, the diversity council can play a lead role in partnering with my office, the equity and diversity office, my role as CDO, the president and the provost, faculty leaders, students, diversity champions and alumni uh, and our board of trustees um, and others who are interested in moving the institutional agenda forward. Uh, introducing reform and best practices where needed. So we meet once a month at the end of the month for about an hour, hour and a half. Um, and we, you know, it's a great meeting of the minds and the membership terms last for two years. And then, you know, I open it up for uh, us to rotate membership. And that is something that the president and I do together. Um, you know, looking for individuals who really are interested in moving the EDI agenda forward. So over the last, um, 
over the last year, you know, we have talked a lot about um, the terms diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, they are not the same thing. They are different things. But um, this year, most importantly, this year, um, we have been dealing with as a nation, as you all know, um, two really big pandemics, right? We have coronavirus and we have a racial pandemic that has been going on in our nation. And it has affected all of our communities. And it has really charged the colleges and the universities nationwide um, to really start to look at, look at ourselves, um, do some self-evaluation and ask deeper questions about the work that we're doing, um, if we're being effective, how we can be more effective. And um, it's really caused colleges to just become more active. And we are a part of the SUNY system. And so I work with a body of administration and, and leaders at the SUNY level uh, regularly throughout each month to talk about what we can do in terms of EDI, uh, which is inclusive of anti-racism and social justice work. So let me just give you a couple of things. Uh, we have been focusing on racism because of the recent killings of, uh, you all are familiar with the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery killings, um, the racial profiling, those along those lines of racial tension across the entire nation. And so racism has been the focus. And if you would just allow me and allow yourselves, um, don't forget, I haven't forgotten that equity, diversity, and inclusion has a broad meaning. There's many things under the umbrella of equity, diversity, and inclusion. But today, right now, in our world, in our community, in our nation, racism is at the forefront and we are an institution of higher learning and we need to start looking at it instead of standing back and not talking about it or being afraid to talk about it. So if we, if we were to take a look at some of the things, these are some of the things that uh, we as a, a SUNY um, of, of 64 campuses have been looking at for our colleges. Um, how does racism show up on our campus? Hiring and promotion, performance evaluations, lack of faculty diversity, classroom interactions, inclusive curriculum, microaggressions, the voiceless student groups, people being silent or even silenced when you even talk about racism, right? It can show up in the student services area by hostile language, inaction from leadership, unfair practices, and sometimes campus policing, right? All of those things are real. Um, we don't talk about them enough, or maybe we don't acknowledge them enough, but they are very real. And so um, as your chief diversity officer, I want to uh, charge you to begin thinking about those things and how it affects us as a college because we are moving towards becoming an anti-racist college. We are moving towards becoming a more inclusive college and being a more equitable, providing more equity in everything that we do as a college as a whole. So um, I would appreciate you, um, you know, just really digging deep to look at those things. There are three subcommittees under the Equity and Diversity Council. And um, I'd like, I would also like to call them uh, co-collaborators. We're all working towards the same goal, but we're focusing on different targets uh, underneath the umbrella of equity and diversity and inclusion. I have uh, our very first, our very first um, collaborator or group under um, the council. You all are very familiar with the Diversity Academy that has been in existence now for two years. You're very familiar with that. Um, it has focused on the broader sense of the terms diversity. Um, over the past two years, we have focused on barriers to equality through uh, educational sessions on race, immigration, global, gender, religion. We've done some book reads and um, invited us a guest author. These are ongoing things that will continue to take place as we 
go forward as an institution. Um, it is just what it sounds like, an academy. It's a place of learning and a place for conversations. So, you know, we'll continue to see more of that as we go forward. The next, um, the next event that, that, that Diversity Academy has that they're focusing on is gender. That is the theme for this fall. And uh, so you will uh, start to see some announcements coming out very soon uh, for November 5th. We're going to focus on gender with a presentation from our very own uh, Jason Perry, along with the Cleaner Coalition. So look for your, uh, check your emails for those announcements. Um, the, the Equity and Diversity Office, uh, or the Council rather, has um, worked diligently on creating a scholarship in light of everything that took place with the racial unrest this year. We had talked a lot about creating a scholarship in our name. And so we did make that happen. The foundation worked with us to um, uh, create a scholarship. Um, you can find that scholarship on the foundation's website if you're interested in uh, helping to increase the amount that we give to students and learning more about uh, what the scholarship is about, please visit the foundation scholarship and you can also donate to it. Um, um, through your payroll deductions or just by providing a donation on your own. The second um, collaborator or committee under uh, the Equity and Diversity Council um, is going to be our racial equity impact analysis uh, tool and coach group. And Tracy is going to tell you a little bit about that group. Great, thank you, Tracy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, wanted to share a little bit about the racial equity impact analysis. I believe most of you probably attended the session. Um, it would have been August of 2019 during convocation where we had um, uh, Race Matters Institute come in and we had Anthony Armstrong and we had um, uh, Tara Lynn come in as um, facilitators and they talked a little bit about the backstory behind um, the racial equity impact analysis training, and um, there were several breakout sessions after that took a deeper dive into the five questions that comprise the racial equity impact analysis. So we do have a training coming up on October 19th, and I'm happy to say we have about 45 people registered for our training. It's going to be virtual. It's going to be delivered by uh, uh, Anthony Armstrong and Tara Lynn uh, as well. And we have a cross section of departments of uh, employees attending, everyone from academic affairs to student affairs to IT to facilities, security, security departments as well. Um, so we have a nice cross section of um, uh, employees attending that training. Um, what I wanted to mention is that, um, in addition to the training, one of the components that, or one of the opportunities that you have if you do attend the training, you have an opportunity to become a real coach. And it, and it isn't necessary. To, you can attend the training and not become a coach because I know there's a question out there about, do I have to attend the training and become a coach? You do not have to become a coach. We'd love to have you as a coach because we simply are trying to get more coaches. We probably have about 12 to 15 coaches now, but we certainly are going to need more coaches as we continue to do this work and expand and push it out um, throughout the campuses and throughout what we do, throughout our policies and procedures and, and, and decisions that we make. Um, so the coaches training, uh, once you attend the initial training, if you're interested in becoming a coach, there is a train to trainer coach session that takes place. And after that, there's additional coaching sessions, which and all of the coaching sessions are free, which is another wonderful opportunity for us to get involved in the coaching. It, it is free and free is a good thing here. So, um, but, um, anyway, so in addition to that, they have a, an additional training called getting started, started as a coach. And then there's training about finalizing your racial equity work plan. And then they have additional uh, sessions, two additional sessions that deal with communication, communications and messaging for your racial equity plan. So there's opportunity to be involved as a coach as well as attending the training. And I encourage you, if you're interested in attending the training, to let me know. We are kind of booked for this coming Monday, but I would like to start a list of people that are so interested so I can see if I could possibly slide you into other sessions that are going to be offered by community foundation for other agencies, um, which is also a good thing to see because you'd be in a session with a little bit more diversity and not just EPC um, staff. Um, in terms of coaches, what we are, there we go, now we go. In terms of coaches, what we're, what we're hoping to move towards and what we've started to do is to use coaches, utilize coaches to sit on search committees 
So Tracy and I are going to be putting together, uh, refining our search committee training and putting together training for coaches that are interested in sitting on search committees. We'd like to try to have a coach on every search committee. That's what we're moving towards. Um, the coaches will also be available to offer training as well in terms of how to you know, answer the five questions, how to um, fuse those five questions into decisions that you make, um, plans that you have, uh, policies that you put together, your syllabus that you put together, your any kind of curriculum you put together. We're hoping to be able to infuse racial equity impact analysis training into that. So I think I've kind of covered what we do under as terms of coaches. I don't know if there's anything else there. I don't know if you have any questions about it. If so, I can certainly answer questions regarding the racial equity impact analysis training. We have several coaches that are on, on the screen that I can see that have participated in the initial training. And I'm, I'm sure they can certainly talk about the initial training and um, their thoughts about it. But it's a very interesting and engaging training. It is uh, offered virtually now. It's from 10 until about 2.30. So there's about two 15-minute breaks and I think maybe a 20 or 30-minute lunch. But it is pretty engaging. It's not, um, you know, and there's several breakout sessions and, and you actually get a chance to what we call test drive the tool using, you know, we'll, we'll determine it could be a job description. It could be a policy that you'll get a chance to work with the tool. So you will get some experience in terms of using the tool, which consists of those five questions. So does anyone have any questions? You're right, this is a quiet group. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, so the next uh, new group to join the Equity and Diversity Council, um, see if I can share. Let me see what I'm going to do here. Can you all see that? You see something that says Anti Racism Task Force Report? No? no, no, it's not up there. No, it's, kind of, it's a gray color. It's just gray. That's all right. It, it'll be up there in one second. All right. Our newest group is the Anti-Racism Task Force. Um, and this is um, just a little bit of their report. The, our group of of staff that joined, basically they came together this year um, as a result of the uh, brutal murders of African-American men uh, that I mentioned earlier um, and all the killings, all the racial tensions and the divides that took place this year. They came together and decided what can we do to help support um, the mission and the goals of this institution in regards to becoming an anti-racist, um, an anti-racist college. Um, and as I said, we are all doing that work, you know, through the racial equity tool, through the equity and diversity office, through diversity academy. It all, um, we are all doing that work. But this group has a special focus in that um, they're they're also going to be focused on what can they do to support our students which is very important, right? Um, students were so hurt, so deeply hurt um, and felt divided this year when all of this was happening in our communities and in our nation. So the task force has met numerous times, as you can see from this report, and they have several meetings going forward. Um, they are an informal group of about 30 and um, they have the support of my office, the support of uh, Tracy Cleveland's office and the support of the president. And so this is something that um, is very important to our institution. I'm not going to read it to you, but I'm going to show you what their charge is. Let's see if I can. Stop sharing. They have a list of activities and events that they will be participating in and sharing with you all. So please, um, please watch your email. Uh, please watch the SUNY Erie News as they will be announcing all the wonderful things that they're going to be taking part in and leading here at this institution. Okay, here we go. Do you see anti-racism charge, task force charge? Yes, okay, wonderful. We just, yep. Great. So this is the anti-racism 
um, their task force charge. Again, they are um, a part of the council. Um, there are many other, um, there's many a part of this task force that are not actually on the diversity council, but you don't have to actually be a member of the diversity council to do equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism, social justice work. You can be doing that throughout these different subcommittees and the ad hoc committees that will be forming out of all of these groups. This is work that we can all continuously do in our roles, um, but here's an opportunity to be a part of something great here. So here's the charge. Again, I'm not going to read it to you, but I would like to read this real, this last paragraph here, which I think is real important. The task force will identify barriers that prevent an anti-racism educational community and will make recommendations to human resources, the chief diversity officer, the equity and diversity council and Erie College's College Senate. It is not enough to be a non-racist, but an anti-racist actively engaging in behavior that seeks to eliminate structural inequalities and institutional racism and bias at SUNY Erie. So uh, the task force uh, has a vision uh, through these five ad hoc committees here where they're going to actively be engaged in uh, putting together some activities and some workshops for um, students. Uh, and I'm pretty sure it will also uh, bleed into our students, our faculty and staff as well. If you would like to be a part of, did I stop sharing? Okay. If you would like to be a part of any of the ad hoc committees um, of these groups, please reach out. Um, you can contact uh, Jacqueline Bossman or Katrina Hill Cheatham for the Anti-Racism Task Force. Um, if you'd like to lead a discussion or a book read, um, or if you'd like to participate in some kind of way through the Diversity Academy, please reach out to Marianne Partee or myself. And if you are interested in the racial equity impact analysis tool, uh, we wanna reach out to the big boss, Tracy Cleveland, but she's holding the money for the RIA tool and she can make it happen for us. <laughs> Any questions about um, uh, our council or the subcommittees um, that are part of us? Okay. Well, I appreciate your, atten your attention. I appreciate the time. And, um, you know, let's focus on equity here at the college. Let's focus on making sure that we have everything that we need for all our students, the same thing for all our students across the board. Let's make sure that we have equity in our faculty and staff, in uh, the work that we do, and, um, you know, just how we are treating our work. Because at the end of the day, we are trying to graduate good citizens. We know, you know, we want them to come back and say, um, when they become the next senator or politician or whatever it is, we want them to come back and say that they learned um, this perspective from SUNY Erie. We are and we can be an excellent institution um, in the next the next generation. So thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Tracy and Tracy. Um, and I know uh, we have Jackie Bossman is also part of our uh, executive team for the Senate. So we'll also be getting direct updates uh, from there from Jackie. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and so we're at the part uh, that is um, going to be the uh, the good for the order. It's and we got three minutes to go. So I don't want to focus, but if there's anything that anyone has that is pressing, um, I know one thing that I, it's a recurring theme for me today is uh, enrollment, but there is a team of faculty, uh, I'm one of them, and uh, so is Erica, that are uh, gathering um, ideas for, that we can share with enrollment management, um, and we're working with Phil in his office, so if um, anyone has any ideas, and no idea is a crazy idea, right? Because sometimes the crazy ideas are the ones that work. Uh, but anything that you've noticed from open registration, because uh, obviously it's going to be remote-ish, maybe a hybrid, but what are your ideas? What do you think you can do as a faculty member um, 
that we can do as a team to help guide open registration, you know, drop ad, all of those very important things that are coming up in January, because um, our goal and Bill's team's goal is to get everything up and rocking and rolling and information out there, because that's the other thing that's going to be better for us is the quicker we have decisions, we know how things are going to look, the better uh, we are to uh, share out to our current students, future students, and all of that, and everyone's on the same page. So um, if you have your thinking caps on, let me know. Um, Jason Steinitz and I are going to be uh, hosting a WebEx, I think, next week. We didn't come up with a date yet uh, with uh, liberal arts uh, faculty. So if you are an LAS faculty member and you want to get in on that and um, give ideas, shoot me an email and I'll send you a WebEx uh, invite. Um, so with that, uh, and then um, I want to also welcome back uh, Karen Huffman. Uh, I didn't notice you were on at the beginning. I'm sorry, Karen. Karen is our FCCC delegate and a faculty member at South Campus. Uh, and she was injured uh, as she was out uh, protesting uh, and our, our local warrior of justice as uh, Jackie uh, refers to her. And so thank you, Karen. I'm so glad that you're getting better and that you're you're here. Um, and uh, here up. and um, election day is right around the corner. It's in a couple of weeks. Go vote, right? Let our voices be heard. There's Supreme Court candidates and all sorts of things on this ticket. So go vote, make your voice heard on November 3rd and Go Bills. I don't, you can't see, I got my Bills earrings on today. I couldn't find my Bills scarf for you, but I got my Bills earrings. Yay, Kathy, and I, D Dave Bohinsky's got a hoodie too, thank you. All the Bills gear, oh yeah, Carrie Owens, excellent. Joel, you guys are amazing. Oh, Jason Perry too, woohoo, go Bills, five and oh baby. Uh, all right, so I'll see everybody in November. Uh, and Kathy, I saw your comment, um, one thing we've, that she's done is uh, reaching out to students who stopped out due to the life situations. Uh, and as a result of uh, some phone calls, uh, she had students sign up for remote learning. So that's something else. And I know um, the, the deans have been working on uh, following up on people that have gotten incompletes and things like that too. So make sure, you know, we're all a team here, just like the Bills. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, they make a lot more money than us, but uh, oh well, right? <laughs> See everybody in November. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.